Animals eat plants. I mean, sure, animals also eat animals, but the one thing that never happens is plants eating animals, right? Well, wrong. These are 20 plants that eat animals. Number 20. The Venus Flytrap now, it's only natural that we'll begin this list with the flesh-eating plant that you all likely know about in the Venus flytrap. This plant's honestly rather special beyond its name and reputation. For example, it's actually the only member of its genus, and furthermore, you'll only find these plants in places like North and South Carolina. Here's the other thing that's really interesting about these plants. You'd assume that because they're eating animals, that they're using their prey for food and sustenance, right? Well, no, not at all. As they're plants, they have photosynthesis abilities and don't actually need all that. However, what they do use the animals for is energy, but not food energy, rather energy in order to survive in the soil conditions that they live in. As hopefully you all know, plants need good soil to survive, but the Venus flytraps aren't always in the best soil conditions, so thus they trap animals and use their energy to withstand the subpar conditions that they find themselves in. Not exactly what you would expect. Obviously, though, it makes the Venus flytrap so famous, or even infamous, as their looks and how they catch prey. They look like mouthy plants, and those mouths have very sensitive hairs. When those hairs are triggered by prey like small insects, they then close and the digestion begins. It takes a while for it to happen, about 10 days in fact, and so only after it's done does the plant open and the cycle all begins again. Say what you will about these plants, they know what they need in order to survive. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Number 19. Sundews. Now, if you're looking for something a bit broader in the scope of carnivorous plants out there in the world, then you have to look at the sundews. There are about 150 or more different sundews out there in the world right now, and unlike the Venus flytrap, they can quite literally be all over the world. Sundews are widely distributed in tropical and temperate regions, especially in Australia, where everything will kill you. What's more, they're fine in living in places like bogs that have very acidic soil. Showing that they can truly survive anywhere and making them a dangerous threat to any small insects or other prey that get a bit too close. One key difference between the sundews and the Venus flytrap, though, is how they catch their prey. The Venus flytraps are very open about how they get them, but the sundews are a bit more sneakier about it all. They have stems that are long and yet curved at the end, and along these stems are very sticky hairs that the insects are trapped in, and then they're engulfed in the hairs. And after that, they're digested by enzymes from within the plant, and only after that does the plant unfurl its stem once more to let the trap get some food. This is honestly kind of freaky. Can I just note that for a moment? Because you'd think that it's a bit more regular of a plant than the flytrap, and yet it's arguably a lot more dangerous because of all how nonchalant that it seems until you get stuck and then engulfed by plant hairs. Sometimes nature is just plain scary, all right? Number 18, Tropical Pitcher Plants. Another very common kind of carnivorous plant is that of the pitcher plant, but what sometimes gets lost in its title is that there are various kinds of them all over the world, and one of them is the tropical pitcher plant. You can find more than 100 species of the tropical pitcher in tropical habitats, like Australia, Madagascar, Papua New Guinea, and others, which include Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka, showing their wide range really. It just goes to show that these are plants that have learned to make the most out of the small areas in which they reside. But what does that mean? Well, not unlike other species on the list, 
The tropical pitcher plant knows that it's going to live in areas that have very poor soil and won't provide enough nitrogen for it to survive. So they get creative, bundling together in areas where they can survive and get a lot of food via animals. Their method's a bit more different from the previous two plants because their bodies are more elongated and they use nectar and fragrances to lure animals like insects into their large bodies. Then when they're in there, they don't come out. There's even a lid from within the plant that helps to ensure that. Not that it really needs it, as the liquid that the insects find themselves in within the plant is both sticky and acidic. A true one-two punch, all in order to ensure that the plant gets what it needs. A fun twist, though, is that some tropical pitcher plants don't need to eat animals to get their nitrogen. Rather, they leave their mouths open and catch bits of leaves or even animal droppings to get what they desire. Again, showing just how clever they are and how diverse these plants can be. Number 17. Bladderwort now, that's just a weird name, bladderwort. It kind of sounds like some kind of medical issue that you don't want to talk to your doctor about. Oh, what do you have, Bob? Well, Doc, I have bladderwort. Uh, it's just not fun to say. But in all seriousness, though, the bladderwort species is one type of carnivorous plant that, in a fun twist, is of an aquatic nature. That's right, you forgot about how there are plenty of plants under the sea, didn't you? In another one, though, the bladderwort grows above water, but uses its body to capture animals under the water. Don't worry, I'm going to explain because it's confusing, I know. The bladders from which the common name is derived are used to capture the prey in question. Hairs at the opening of the bladder serve as triggers, and when contacted, mechanically cause the trap to spring open, drawing in water and organisms like a vacuum. Enzymes and or bacteria inside the traps then aid in the digestion process. So yeah, that's one way to get it done. And again, it does showcase how clever these plants are in order to get the prey that they desire. Using a vacuum to get your prey? That's some kind of special right there. And because of their aquatic setting, you'll find these bladder warts all over the place. Some are even found in just about every state within the U.S. Plus, you'll find them in all kinds of water settings like lakes, and rivers, and marshes, and so on. So if you are paying attention, you may just see a bladder wart near where you live. Number 16. Butter Wart now, <laughs> this one may just be a worse name than the previous one. This is the kind of name that people would try to come up with to make something sound better than it is. Butterwort. What are you even trying to have us do? Eat it? That's not recommended in this case, especially if you're a small animal that thinks that this plant can't harm you. If it's not obvious, it absolutely can. You'll notice that this plant, like others on the list, can be found in damp areas such as bogs, fens, wet heaths, and rock crevices. And like many other plants that we've already discussed, the main problem for the butterwort is that it doesn't have the resources around it in terms of living space to get the nitrogen and energy that it needs to survive. However, it has become able to devour insects so that it could get what it needs. The butterwort typically comes in a purple color, and they use that color along with a special star spot to lure insects in because they think that they've found a perfect place to potentially get things like pollen or nectar. Instead, though, they've just simply signed their death warrant. The leaves have a sticky substance that will ensure the insects don't fly away, and then the leaves themselves will wrap around the insect to further cement its meal. And if you're curious, there is apparently a reason that it's called the butterwort, and it may not be what you're thinking. You see, there was a lot of superstition in regards to this plant. The Scottish actually believed that if you picked it, you'd be protected from witches. And then if you were able to rub this plant on the udders of a cow, the evil spirits wouldn't be able to harm the milk and butter that the cow produces. Number 15. Cobra Lily 
Now, this is a name for a carnivorous plant, and I'm not just saying that because I just got done watching Cobra Kai Season 4. Definitely not saying that at all. However, when you add Cobra to your title, well, you're trying to make a statement, especially if you're a carnivorous plant. The Cobra plants, native to swamps and mountainous areas of Northern California and Southern Oregon, and if you look at the heads of these things, you'll see something rather obvious. They look like the head of a cobra which is only emboldened by how the body of the plant looks like a snake body as well. Sometimes nature just wants you to look cool. Oh, and did I mention that it has coloring that makes it look like the plant has a snake tongue and fangs? Because it totally does. But there's something you likely don't expect. While they do live in forests, in those states that I mentioned, they're not your typical forests, rather they're ones that are high up in altitude, 6,000 feet above sea level in fact. That's unusual because typically you'd associate plants with being in areas that are rich in sunlight and heat, but in these places, it doesn't get above 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, like the snake, the cobra lily knows how to trap its prey, luring it in, and then using various tactics to ensure that it can't get out of its mouth. Number 14. Genela Sea Genela sea is both a plant and a genus of carnivorous plants, but we'll focus on the main plant itself for this one. This plant is one of the larger kinds of carnivorous plants in this genus, and they're known for growing bundles. Specifically, they form small, compact rosettes composed of nearly linear leaves, about 2 millimeters wide, and the leaves are typically 5 to 50 millimeters in length, but most of that length is hidden beneath the soil. And this is where the fun twist comes in, because their traps are honestly beneath the soil. Not something that we've seen on this list before, but in a twist, there had been a lot of debate about whether or not this plant was honestly carnivorous. Charles Darwin himself even thought that it was a carnivorous plant, but since no one could find out how it did it, as again the trap was underground, no one really believed him or anyone else. Then in 1998, Wilhelm Barthlot and his colleagues concluded, through experimentation, that the plant attracts prey chemotactically, trapping it in a corkscrew lobster pot trap, digesting it with enzymes produced by the plant, and then absorbing the nutrients, showing like always that if you want to find the answers to something, you honestly have to go and test it out to see what happens. Because if they didn't, for this one, we wouldn't know about one of the more unique carnivorous plants out there in the world today. Number 13. Aldravanda vesiculosa. Now I could make a lot of fun of this name, but to be honest, it'd be way too easy. And honestly, it's better that I don't, because this one is one of the cooler carnivorous plants that you'll see on this list. But why is that, you may ask? Well, first of all, it's completely aquatic. Secondly, unlike pretty much every other plant on this list, it's a free-floating entity, and it is rather cool-looking to boot. They're shaped like whorls, allowing them to have a large amount of individual plants connected to a base, all in order to help ensure that it gets its food. Now you can find four to nine of its mouthy heads on a single whorl, not something that you'd really expect from a plant like this. And like others out there, this one lures in its prey and then uses its mouth and even rope-like hairs to ensure that the prey doesn't get out. What's more, the plant is very durable, even being able to survive winter freezing, which is definitely not something that most plants, let alone carnivorous plants, are prone to do. And as if that wasn't enough, this plant can actually be considered a living fossil, since its lineage dates all the way back to about tens of millions of years ago further putting it in the category of being very cool. Now, most of these plants are native to Japan and its boggy waters, so if you're near such a place in the future, be on the lookout for this one. Number 12. Saracenia 
Now I've already talked about pitcher plants before, but there are a wide variety of them out there in the world right now that bear talking about, one of which is the Saracenia. These are a set of pitcher plants that you'll find in various places within the United States, which include Texas, the Great Lakes, and even countries like Canada. As you would expect, these pitcher plants are known for their long bodies that they use to help lure in insects and get the nutrients that they need to survive. But they're also very smart in that they use a variety of methods to get the job done. Like others named before, they use the way that they smell in order to attract their prey, but they also use their body colors in order to get them as well. Once the insect lands on the rim, they're trapped because the rim is slippery and thus they fall into the body where they never return again. <laughs> Also, have you noticed that if evil villains wanted to get rid of a hero, they just need to mimic that of a pitcher plant setup and be done with them? Now sure, the movie or television show would kind of end oddly, but at least the bad guy would win for once, and that's what we all want, don't we? On a more sad note, the Saracenia species is honestly in a lot of danger, as its habitat is heavily threatened by people. Just in the southeastern United States, over 97% of its habitats have been destroyed by humans. Now, while there are some that are trying to save the plants, it probably won't be enough if certain urban development and habitat destruction isn't stopped. Number 11. Western Australian Pitcher Plant well, doesn't this plant look absolutely menacing? Aren't carnivorous plants meant to look stealthy all in order to ensure that insects and such come into them? Because if that's the case, then the Western Australian pitcher plant falls on that front. And it should be noted that this plant is indeed special, to the extent that it's the only member of its genus. Probably for the best, because who would want to be related to this thing? I'm just saying. There are other things that set it apart from other carnivorous plants though, such as how it's about eight inches tall and has a deep root system. Furthermore, it has more traditional leaves to make it seem more like a regular plant. I guess it didn't completely abandon the stealth aspect, did it? The opening of the pitcher is adorned with a number of smooth, dark red rings that produce an attractive nectar and prevent climbing insects, primarily ants, from escaping. It's all a very clever thing. What's also clever about this plant is that it knows what it wants food-wise and isn't about to let another kind of insect inside. You see, it doesn't really like pollinators, so it has special flowers on its stalks that grow near its trap, but not right next to it thus ensuring that the pollinators won't go in and get trapped. Now, I still think it looks pretty ugly though. Seriously, it's just very hard to look at. Number 10, Trifiophyllum peltatum. Now, I know I probably really mangled that pronunciation, but if you look at this plant, the only species in the genus, you'll notice something rather quickly. It's big especially in its very long leaves, as well as a stem that's said to be able to get very long, you know, like over 150 feet long. The point here is that this plant is the largest confirmed carnivorous plant in the world today, by a large margin in fact, but not unlike a plant that I discussed earlier, a lot of people didn't realize that it was a flesh eater for quite a long time. 51 years in fact, so that again shows why research has to be done on these plants, even if they don't seem to be the most interesting thing around. In fact, there's no doubt why this one didn't get its true designation for a while, because it had the looks of just a regular plant and not a carnivorous one especially when compared to all the other plants out there that are carnivorous. Oh, and just its seeds are said to be inches long. Inches! Inches for seeds! That's a very big plant, and so you honestly just have to feel bad for the food that gets trapped inside of it, because they really thought that it was just a really big plant, and it wasn't. Number 9. Nepenthes now, if you recall earlier me talking about the tropical pitcher plant, you'll want to know that these are in the family that they belong to. 
but I wanted to dive into this one further because there are actually 170 species within Nepenthes, and not all of them are what you would expect. For example, while many of the species are natural, there are others who have been cultivated and bred to be special, even bringing in some hybrids along the way. What's more, they're also known as monkey cups because of a long-held belief that due to their shape, monkeys would come and drink from them. But we know that this is false for very obvious reasons, or at least obvious to everyone now, and that's because of what is in those cups, and it wouldn't be good for the monkeys to drink. You know, because of all the acidity and bacteria, but yeah, not good for the monkeys at all. Still though, this brand of pitcher plant is able to live in all kinds of areas, showing just how adaptable that it can be in order to survive. Number 8. Brachinia reducta Brachinia reducta is a very curious carnivorous plant, mainly because there are two plants within the genus, and both are believed to be a kind of carnivorous plant, but some aren't sure due to the structure of the plant and how it's believed to be carnivorous. So the jury's actually still out as to whether these two belong in that group or not, but for now, why not? How does this particular plant get its prey though? Well, the leaves form a tightly bound, erect column that looks like an organ pipe, and just like an organ pipe, the center of the column is hollow. Unlike an organ pipe though, it's full of water and the decaying remains of insects that have fallen into the tube. Here apparently we have a simple pitfall pitcher plant, one that does have some refinements according to scientists, which includes how the water itself is perfumed in order to lure in its prey. In a twist though, there are some insects that apparently live and grow within the urn of this plant, further making many wonder if they honestly are carnivorous or just something else entirely. Number 7. Roradula now here's another carnivorous plant that's rather impressive. In fact, some think that they're amongst the most impressive of these kinds of plants. And that's because the two species of Roradula can grow really tall. But how tall, you may ask? Well, at full length, they can be about six feet tall. They're also shrubbish in form, and that allows them to take on a lot more area to do their work. Add to that that they have pink flowers and are apparently beautiful to look at, and that all makes perfect lures for prey. Here's a fun fact though, in South Africa these plants are known to snare birds on accident. Now obviously the plant doesn't eat the bird, but could you imagine if it did? But wait, there's more! and it's a big twist. Up to now, all the carnivorous plants shown have been able to process their food by what they have within them. But for the Roradula, not so much. They apparently need help from an insect known as the assassin bug, all in order to help get the nutrients that they want to need. So for people who try and grow this plant, which yes, there are people out there that do, they need to give the plant supplemental nutrition as they aren't getting it in the natural way. Number six, trigger plant. Now yes, I'm going back to the name gag because this is a great name for a plant. It's simple, effective, and explains what it does while also sounding very cool. Regardless, this is honestly a really curious plant that deserves attention and not just for its carnivorous ways, because the reason it's called the trigger plant isn't because of what you would think. It's not that it gets triggered by the pressing of its body and then snatches its prey. Rather, an insect will touch a certain part of the flower and then the flower will react by hitting it with a whip-like part that then douses the insect with pollen. Yes, the trigger is to help cross-pollination happen. Who knew? But don't get confused, the trigger plant is carnivorous in its own way, but most believe that most of these plants digest insects as a kind of defense strategy to ensure that other parts of the flower doesn't get hurt. Though some of the species do have smaller enzymes to break down bacteria like many other carnivorous plants, unlike the others, it's not likely to be its primary function. Number 5. Moccasin Plant 
The moccasin plant, also known as the pink lady slipper, is another plant that you could question whether or not it's honestly carnivorous. But why? Well, because while it does trap insects inside of its body, that doesn't mean that it eats them. Rather, this plant is infamous for its tough pollination process, and as a result, it has a tough time of surviving. In fact, it only lives in certain places in the world and needs very specific acidic soil in order to live thus making things like transplanting it very difficult. Now, as noted, it does trap insects, mainly bees, inside of its body, but it does this in order to give it pollen. The problem is that the bees get no benefit from doing this kind of process, and as a result, they simply tend to leave these plants alone. Number four, corkscrew rush. Yet another well-named plant, it's really so hard to come up with good names, isn't it? It shouldn't take long for you to realize why this plant is so easily named. It has a whirling pattern to its body and appendages, and as a result, it looks like a corkscrew. But in an interesting twist, the plant is said to be a rather invasive species in the wrong climate, putting a bit of a twist on the carnivorous title. Apparently, a lot of people like to have them and grow them, probably because of their very unique form. And that's honestly not too surprising, because people love to grow exotic plants. Insects may not have much to fear from these, but the environment certainly does. Number three, the Cape Sundew. Going back to one of the tried and true carnivorous plants, we look at the Cape Sundew, a carnivorous plant that is 100% carnivorous, and something that, again for some reason, people enjoy growing. In fact, it's apparently one of the easiest carnivorous plants to raise. Insects are lured to the plant and get mired in the sticky dew of its tentacles, and the leaves slowly roll over onto the prey in about 30 minutes, creating an effective digestive pouch around its victim. Then when it's done just a few days later, it'll unfurl and leave the victim, or what's left of it, to rot. Another interesting tidbit is that if you live in a warm area, this plant will apparently grow year-round, hence why it's such an easy plant for gardeners to grow. They must really like watching insects die. Number 2. Drosera filiformis Drosera filiformis are not unlike certain plants that I've talked about before because they're long and have all sorts of sticky hairs that grow out of them. Once a bug latches on, they'll get wrapped up by the hairs and be slowly digested. What a way to go! But in a twist, a lot of people do like to grow these plants and their siblings because they can be rather pretty to look at, and some even like to mix the sibling plants in, all in order to grow a hybrid that's also something to behold. However, for the insects, I'm just going to bet that they don't appreciate all that beauty. It's just a hunch. Number one. Pinguacula grandiflora. While not a full-on carnivorous plant, this one is defined as a temperate insect eater, meaning that it will eat insects, but it doesn't necessarily have to like most of the other plants that I've discussed today. One thing that definitely separates it though from its fellow bug-eating plants is its flower, While other plants do use flowers to lure in insects, this one has a flower that's much bigger than others in its genus. And if you want to go and find this one, you can see it in many places across Europe. That's all from the realm of plants that are a bit meaner than you may have realized. Were you shocked to learn that there were so many out there that could eat animals in one form or another? How many of these plants did you know about beforehand? And do you know of any others that could be on this list? Be sure to let me know all about it in the comments below. Also, check out the other cool stuff that's showing up on the screen, and I'll see you next time.